Hi guys, in this tutorial we're going to look at some application of differentiation. Among the questions we're going to do, we're going to look at this question. Um, yeah, it looks interesting, so we're going to take a look at it. It's going to be one of the examples. Then I'm going to look at a few more examples as we go through. Now, the, one of the key applications of uh, differentiation is it helps us predict what the rate of change of a given quantity is with respect to another variable. A differentiation or a derivative expressed as let's say of, of a function we can say of a function uh, a function y with respect to another variable x this tells us how y changes with respect to changes in x so in other words it helps us understand what y becomes whenever x changes by a certain amount so this is what a derivative gives us now in simple terms if you have a curve like this one. Say so you have a curve like this one. What a derivative at any point actually gives us is how the function y, let's say this is for something like this, on the x, y axis. So we have our x this side and we have our y this side. What the derivative at any point will give us is how y is changing with respect to x at that particular point. And if you look at it, if I wanted to get my change in change in y if i wrote it as a change in y over a change in x notice that this is just an evaluation of the gradient at that particular point so the gradient at that particular point can also be evaluated by just drawing a tangent line that touches our curve just at that point so the gradient of this line would also be equal to the gradient of the curve at that exact point but the idea of drawing a line like this, a tangent line, and then getting the gradient of that tangent line, it works as well. But what we see here is that a derivative is just faster in getting the answer. Of course, if the function is defined at that point. Now, because of that, how do we actually uh, put this into use? And how do we actually get to understand how this, this works? So for the first part, it's very straightforward. Yeah, let's try to see an example where we're just trying to determine the gradient at a specific point and let's see how it works. Well, this example just demonstrates what we just described. It's an easy case of application of um, differentiation. In this case, they want us to determine what the gradient of a function, and this is the function, what will be the gradient at this specified point. So to get the answer here, all you have to do is to evaluate what dy dx is at that specific point. So we're differentiating our function and our function here is given as 3x squared minus 2x plus 4. So to differentiate this of course we know to say differentiation is distributive. So differentiate each term one at a time. The derivative of the first term becomes 6x. The derivative of the second term becomes just 2. The derivative of the constant becomes a 0. So this is our derivative. So dy dx is equals to 6x minus 2. But now we want to find what this is at, at 1,5. At 1,5, the x value is 1. Yeah, that's 1. So what we're going to do is we're just going to substitute what 1 is where there is x. So we find that the derivative now becomes dy dx. This becomes equals to 6 multiplying 1 minus 2. And when we simplify this, we get the answer as 6 minus 2, which is just equals to 4. So this becomes the gradient at that specific point. Now, this, is, this was the easy case. There are some questions which might be tricky that we can come across. We'll see more as we go. Now, apart from this, one of the most used uh, uh, technique when we are trying to evaluate the application of differentiation is perhaps in the determination of the maximum and minimum points. Well, what you have to understand is that for a curve that is, say, something like this, with a maximum point somewhere at this point, what you have to see here is that if you drew a tangent to this curve at that specific point, at the turning point, so if I drew a tangent at the turning point, what you have to understand is that the gradient of my tangent here, this horizontal line, 
we know to say its y value even if i was to put the x y plane here let me put the x y plane there so if i was to put the x y axis uh, here what you'd have to see here is that the values of y are not changing even though the values of x are varying at this point so for that point if i try to get the gradient of my tangent line there what you see is that there will be no change in y even though the we can get a change in x for that line in other words this rate of change is actually equals to a zero so for a turning point whether it's a maximum point or a minimum point or a point of inflection what you have to see is that the gradient at that particular point is going to be a zero so that is one key thing that we try to take advantage of when you're trying to determine um, when you're trying to find the maximum or minimum points the fact that uh, the gradient at those particular points is going to be is going to be zero consider the question that uh, that we did earlier on let's get that function but this time around instead of looking for the gradient at that at one comma one comma five let's instead try to find what the position of the turning point is going to be so in this case we're not trying to find whether it's a maximum or a minimum or so on what we're trying to do is let's find the location of that turning point so if we wanted to do that of course the first step would be to get the derivative so just like before we sort to say the derivative of y with respect to x was 6x minus 2 so that's the first thing that you have to do the second thing that you have to remember here is that at the turning point the derivative with respect to um, to x has to be equals to zero so this is at the turning point all right tp for turning point so because of that since the derivative was this and the derivative has to be equals to zero then 6x minus 2 must be equals to zero if we are finding the turning point this implies that 6x is equals to 2 or x is equals to 2 over 6 which reduces to 1 over 3 so we have found the x value at the turning point now we can use the x value to predict what the y value is going to be so the last step uh, in this calculation would be to use the value we have found of x in the original expression so go back to the original expression which is this one here but what we're going to do is where there is x substitute what uh, what that value for x is so in this case we're going to have 3 and i'm seeing an x there so that's 1 over 3 and it has to be squared minus 2 again 1 over 3 here and then plus plus 4 then from here we just solve this for, for y and this is what we end up as the value of y so with this we can make a conclusion here therefore the turning point tp will be equal to the point which is has an x value 1 over 3 comma the y value which is 11 over 3 so this these this becomes the coordinate of the turning point this makes sense it is a quadratic equation and the quadratic equation has one turning point so sometimes you'll be given quadrat um, polynomials of high, highest order 3 or of, of degree 3. Those will have two turning points. So you'd have to find both those turning points. Now, what do we go from here? Well, the second step, or uh, the most commonly asked question, apart from just determining what the turning points would be, is perhaps to determine what type of turning point it's going to be. There are three types that you expect to see here. So you expect to have either a maximum turning point or a minimum turning point or a point of inflection. Now, if we have a graph already drawn for us, something like this, identifying these is actually very easy. A minimum point just tells us the minimum most value of y that we can have or whatever is in the vertical axis in this case the minimum most point becomes the bottom most value that we can get going downwards so that gives the minimum point to be something that is going to be somewhere here a maximum point however talks about the highest value that y can ever have 
can be y, it can be anything really on the vertical axis. In this case, it will be given by a curve that turns or to have a tip like this one. So this is where we expect the, the, the maximum value to be. So maximum value will be our C here. So maximum that is at point C and minimum we saw that that was at A. Now a point of inflection is going to be a point like this one here. It's not a minimum, it's not a maximum. So that is what a point of inflection is, is going to be. Now, if you have a graph already drawn for you, it might be easy for you to actually identify what these points are. But how do you do it if you don't have a graph already drawn? Are you going to sketch the function or not? Well, you can sketch it and you'll be able to find exactly what you're looking for. But you can actually predict what the point is even without having to sketch the function. And to do that, you use the second derivative test. Now, how does it go? Well, when you differentiate the function the second time, so when you get the second derivative of y with respect to x, now there are three possible cases that you expect to see. There are three cases that you expect to see. Either the second derivative will be a number that is greater than zero, or the second derivative will be a number that is less than zero, or maybe it will be a number that is equal to zero. So these are the three cases that you expect. Now, let's see. If, let's say, the second derivative gives you a number that is greater than zero, then such a turning point, at that turning point, what you expect to have is actually, if it is greater, then you have a minimum point. Now, if it is less than zero, then you're dealing with a maximum point. And if it is equals to zero, then you're dealing with the point of inflection. Now, how do you actually get to find the number? Because the second derivative itself, it might not be an exact number. It might also be a function of a specific variable. Now, how do you move on with that? Well, for the example that we did, it was actually very straightforward. We got the first derivative. So we got the first derivative of our function. And the first derivative gave us, it right, gave us this. So this was the first derivative. So let's continue with that. Let's see what type of point that one was. So this was what the first derivative gave us. So from here, we can just differentiate this one more time. So now we get the second derivative of this function with respect to x. And what we see is that when you differentiate this, the answer is just a six. And when we see this, six is greater than zero so because of that, when you come back here, 6 being greater than 0, then that turning point was actually a minimum, a minimum point. But it won't always be that easy. In most cases, what you'd have to do is to determine the nature of a turning point, first, get the first derivative. So you'd first get the first derivative. So these are the steps that you have to follow. Get the first derivative. So... Getting the first derivative, what does it do? It helps you find where the turning points are. So get the first derivative, and then once you get the first derivative, equate it to zero. So equate that to zero, and solve to find the turning points. Solve to find the values of x um, at the turning point. So this is step one. So you get whatever the function is. Let's say this is a function. This is y a function of x. So differentiate it once uh, and equate it to zero so that you find the values of x at the turning point. Once you find those values of x, just like we did in the, in, in the second example, you then get the values of x, substitute them in the original expression so that you find their corresponding values of y. Since turning points, they are coordinates. So you have the x coordinate and the y coordinate. So for each value of x, substitute it in the original expression so that you find the corresponding value of y. So once you have found the coordinates of the turning point, the next part that will be left is to now determine the nature of um, each turning point. So to determine the nature of each turning point, this is where the second derivative test comes in. So nature of the turning point. 
in the with the first two steps we were just getting where the turning points were now we want to determine the nature of each turning point so it can be that we only have one turning point like in the first example um, the question I just from dealing with but it can be that you have two or more turning points so you'd have to do these these steps for each one of those points so this leads us to step three and step three starts with getting the second derivative so get the second derivative now after evaluating what the second derivative uh, will be look at the function that you're going to get look at what the second derivative is going to give you if it gives you another function of x like something that contains the variable x in it then you'd have to go to step four if when you differentiate the second time you get something which doesn't have the variable like the way this um, this question turned out when i got the second derivative i just got a six where i didn't have the variable anymore it was just a number like that i moved on to to check whether it was greater or less or equals to zero but if let's say it gave us something that has a variable what do we do from there well that would lead us to step four because for step four we now want to substitute in that second derivative you want to substitute the values of x uh, that we found for the for the turning point so substitute those values um, for the turning point so substitute what each of those values would be so one at a time substitute into what the second derivative will give you and then um, yeah see what what they give you and then the last step would now be a comparison so that you can then make these um, uh, these conclusions so you'd have to go back to this now so i'll just copy it from here and this will be our fifth and final step so you'd have to compare what you found in step two and see if it is greater than zero it's a minimum if it says less than zero it's a maximum and if it is equals to zero then that point is going to be a point of inflection so this is how you check the nature of a turning consider this example in this example now what we want to find are so we want to find the turning points of the function y and then apart from that we also want to determine the nature of each turning point that we're going to find so to do that of course we're going to use the same methods that we showed earlier on the first part would be to differentiate so let's get our function here so this is what the function is so I'll just copy this function now just so I'll just get function the way it is so let's differentiate this function so let's get dy dx so the derivative here so the first term is going to be 3x squared the second term is going to be minus 6x then the third term is just going to be plus 3 the derivative of a constant that's a zero so that part is going to be a zero but since you're looking for the turning points the derivative of a function at a turning point will be equals to zero implying that this term has to be equals to zero at the turning point so this has to be equals to zero so from here now we just have to solve this function for x so of course we can use any methods we can uh, use the product and sub method so the product here becomes 9x squared and then uh, the two factors are going to be minus 3x and minus 3x when you multiply you get positive 9x squared and when we add we get minus 6x you can do it stepwise we have 3x squared minus 3x minus 3x then plus 3 notice that i've substituted the minus 6 by the two factors that give us that when i add them so this is what is equals to zero here from here we get what's common between these two that is 3x what remains here is going to be x and then what remains here is minus 1 from this term i'll pull out minus 3 what remain here is x what remain here is minus 1 as well this is what is equals to zero notice that these two are the same that's okay so i'll get what is outside the brackets which is 3x here then the other term we have a 3 then we have x minus 1 here is equals to zero from this resulting expression we can see that we have 3x minus 3 being equals to zero or x minus 1 has to be equals to zero it's the only way that the product of two expressions will give us zero either one expression is equals to zero or the other expression has to be the one that is equals to zero that's the only way that their product will give us a zero 
From here we see that we have 3x is equal to 3, implying that x is equal to 1, or even from the other term we're seeing the same thing, x is also equal to 1. So this, this function is um, a little bit weird, just touches the x-axis, uh, perhaps at this point. So we thought we were going to find two points, but it literally just touches the x-axis when x is equal to 1. That is why we're seeing just one point here. Now, from here, of course, uh, since we only have one turning point uh, in this case, the other, it will have two points, but perhaps the other point uh, doesn't necessarily... Okay, so from here, having found um, our, our single point here, the next thing we're going to do is let's determine its coordinates. Of course, we're just going to substitute x is equal to 1 in the original expression. The original expression is this one here. So we just plug in x is equal to 1. So we have this function. And then we'll just put 1 where there is x. So this becomes y is equal to, we have 1 here to the power 3, minus 3, plus 3, plus 6. So this becomes, uh, that's just 1 minus 3, plus 3, plus 6. And this becomes equal to, uh, equal to 7. So you have y is equal to 7. So our turning point here is going to be at 1,7. Okay. Now, to determine the nature of this point, we then want to go back to our original, exp uh, not our original expression, the second derivative. We want to get the second derivative. So we'll get the derivative that we got, the first one, and then we'll just differentiate this the second time. So we now want to get the second derivative of y with respect to x. So if we differentiate this, the first term gives us 6 x, then the second term just gives us minus 6. The third term, this will give us a 0. So this is what the second derivative will be. Now, want to find what the second derivative will be at that point, and the point is 1, 7. So want to find what the second derivative will be at 1, 7. So what we do is that in the second derivative, we plug in what the x value is going to be. And our x value is a 1 here. So this is going to be 6 times 1, and then minus 6. And when we evaluate this, this gives us a 0. So since we've seen that the second derivative is actually equals to 0, we then go back to our checklist to see what we have. And our checklist was saying this. If the second derivative is greater than 0, the point is maximum. If the second derivative is less than 0, then the point is minimum. If the second derivative is equal to 0, then we have a point of inflection. This implies that the point that we're dealing with in our function is actually a point of inflection. So this is how we go about this. It would have been the same approach, even if it was a point of, um, if it was minimum or maximum. The only difference is we probably wouldn't have got a 0 here if it was maximum or if it was minimum. So I hope this gives you an idea of how you approach such questions. Now let's end with the last question, the first question that I showed you guys at the beginning of this video. In this example, we have the length of a rectangular box that is three times its width. And then if the volume is 372 centimeter cubic, find the dimensions of the box if the surface area is to be minimum. Well, we're saying two things here. And the first part is that the length of this material or this object is actually dependent on the width. So if I was to write the base of this object, if I wrote the base as just this part, so if I wrote the base as something like this, what we're seeing is that the length, if I wrote this as my length, we're seeing the length is dependent on what the width is. So let me use W for the width. So these two are very dependent on each other or should i say the length depends on what the width is in fact i can say instead of my length here i can just be using how it relates to the width and the question says it is three times what the width is so the length is actually a function of the width i can even say the length is a function of the width like this now with that in mind what else is the question saying well, it is a box. So we also have uh, the height here. So we have something like this here. 
then I'll just copy this to complete my okay so this is how our box looks like now let's say this side let's call this as our height edge now what is our question saying well the first part of course is that statement the length of the rectangular box is three times its width they're saying if its volume is 372 centimeter cubic find the dimensions of the box the surface area has to be minimum so let's start with uh, the volume part well to get the volume of a cube in this case the volume has to be equals to l b times h in this case i'm not i'm not using um, uh, the breadth i'm using the width so i can say the length times the width times the height but we see the relationship between uh, the length and the width so instead of our length we'll put the width there we'll put three by the width so this becomes three w and then multiplying uh, the w the one on the middle and then multiplying the height there so this becomes three the width squared and then h so this becomes an expression for the volume but the question does give us what the volume is three nine nine seventy two so in other words what we have is nine seven two being equal to three w squared and then h here this can reduce so that we have three to four being equal to w squared and then h so this becomes our first expression of interest now how do we take advantage of this or how do we proceed from here well we've seen how the first two parts of the question uh, how we take advantage of them the only thing that we haven't touched on so far is the last condition the surface area is to be minimum what does this imply well you really have to understand what it means there the surface area has to be minimum the key mistake that you might make is to interpret the surface area to imply the base area the two are different if it was the base surface area it would have been talking about the surface area just at the bottom of this object but the fact that they're saying the surface area they're talking about everything everything that makes its surface in other words if you look at this uh, this box it has it has how many surfaces it has six faces altogether. Each face has its corresponding surface. If I was to color them, we have one surface to be here. And the next face will be obviously this one here. And the other face would have to be this face that is right inside there, which is that face, which is uh, literally the other side of this box. So you have to be able to see all these. Now I've just shaded uh, three faces here, but you have to see that each face has got uh, what I would call a twin, if I if I'd use that term. In other words, like for example, the red face, this face here, will be similar to this face here, and the face painted yellow will be similar to, or it will have the same area as this one, and the one painted blue here, it will have the same area. As this face here so you have to see all that so now you have to calculate what the surface area for each face is going to be so you can calculate the area for this face to get the area for this face you know you are multiplying the width times the height of the box and then to get the area for the yellow part you are multiplying uh, this face which is the length but instead of length we'll be using 3 multiplying the width then we'll multiply this by, by the width because this face will literally be the same as the width down here. And then to get the face in blue the other side, we'll use the height which is here and then we'll be multiplying the height by this line at the bottom which is 3 multiplying the width. But because each of these faces occurs twice, we'll just double them so that we get the overall answer. So in other words, we can get our area here so our surface area will be equal to the first part i can say for the first part i'll multiply uh, the red face here that's the width times the height so we have the width times the height 
but because it, this phase occurs twice to um, include the other phase as well, I'll just double it. So I'll have two the width times the height. Then the next part, I'll go to uh, the blue face. For the blue face, I'll multiply the height h times three uh, the width, three times the width. So I'll have this is plus three w multiplying the height that is uh, three three the width, three times the width multiplying the height. But this face also occurs twice. So again, I'll multiply it by two. Then plus the now we go to the yellow one. For the yellow one, it's three times w, three w multiplying w. That's that. So that is how we're going to get that. So we're going to have three by the width multiplying the width. This face as well will occur twice. So I'll multiply it by two as well. We simplify this. We now have two multiplying this plus. And then we'll have this becomes six the width multiplying h then plus then this becomes six the width squared uh, these two can add their like terms so this becomes eight the width the height plus six multiplying the width squared so this becomes an expression for our area now look at what is happening here well you have to see that the question gave us the condition when stating what the area was. Here's what they said. They said so that the surface area is minimum. Now, what is controlling the surface area? To a large extent, the surface area is being controlled by the width. So, because the width is what is actually saying a lot here. So, to ensure that we're dealing with the minimum, we are going to get this expression and we're going to differentiate it. We'll differentiate this with respect to uh, to the width. So again, to, de to get the derivative of our area with respect to, to the width. Now, in this case, when you differentiate this with respect to the width, what you're going to get here is going to be 8h. And then you differentiate the second part with respect to the width, what you're going to get is going to be 12 multiplying the width. But remember, this has to be minimum. If this has to be minimum, it implies that we're dealing with a turning point of some sort, implying that the derivative has to be equals to zero. So we'll just equate this to zero. If we solve what we now have, we get 8h plus 12, the width being equals to zero. From here, let's see what I'm trying to... Uh, let me make h the subject of the formula so that I'll just bring it here. So if I make h the subject here, what I get is 8h is equals to minus 12 the width. From here, I can simplify this. 4 can go into each so that I have 2h is equals to minus 3 the width. So that in the end, h is equals to minus 3 over 2 the width. So this becomes my second expression. I can then get this expression and substitute it into my first expression. Let's just copy what our first expression was. So we had this one here. So if we now perform the substitution here, what we get is uh, w to the power 3, where there's h, we'll put minus 3 over 2, the width, then this being equal to 3, 2, 4. So that this is the same as minus 3 over 2, the width to the power 3 being equal to 3, 2, 4. From here, this is the same as the width to the power 3 being equal to minus. So this will be 2 times 3, 2, 4, then divided by, divided by 3. So that the width will just be equal to the cubic root of 2 by 3 to 4 over 3. Of course, we have that minus here. So if we do the math here, we get our width as minus 6 centimeters. So in other words, our width, we can just take our width as, as a 6 centimeters. So from here, we can then go on to find the other values. So we wanted the uh, the length 
and also the height. Remember what the length was. The length is just three times the width. Since the width is six centimeters, so the length has to be three by six. So the length becomes 18 centimeters. How about the height? Well, equation two gave us an expression for the height and it was just three over two. It was this one. So if you want to maintain the negatives, of course, then this would of course be a minus there. So if you wanted to get the height here, so this would be equal to minus three over two, and then our width is six. So we have, our width is, we got actually minus six there. So this becomes two here goes three times into that. Then we have this, this gives us a nine centimeters. So there we have it. Our length is uh, 18 centimeters. Our width is six centimeters. And our height is nine centimeters. So these are the dimensions of our box. Now right, guys, hope you found this helpful. If you'd like to see more math, more math videos, leave a comment in the comment section. We'll see you guys in the next in the next tutorial.